you for being a part of this event and share your talent with us. Sarasvati, also known as Sharda, is an eternal goddess of knowledge, music, art, and wisdom. She is a part of the divine trinity of Saraswati, Lakshmi, Parvati. Goddess Saraswati is worshipped, and devotees seek knowledge and wisdom in the form of blessing of her. Hence, in order to seek her and initiate her blessing, now I would like to call Miss Divya on the stage for Saraswati Vandana. Master Pranam, Ek, Do, Teen. Ya Kunde Du Tu Shar Har Dhavla Ya Shubra Vastra Vrata Ya Veena Vad Dand Mandit Kara Ya Shvet Padma Sana Ya Brahma Chut Shankar Prabhati Bhe Devai Sada Vandita Sama Patu Saraswati Bhagavati Krish Jandya Paha Shlokar जो विद्या की देवी भगवती सरस्वती कुंड के फूल चंद्रमा हिम राशि और मोती के हाथ की तरह धवल वर्ण की है और जो श्वेत वस्त्र धारण करती है जिनके हाथ में वीरा दंड शोभ्यमान है जिन्होंने श्वेत कमलों पर आसन ग्रहण किया है तथा ब्रह्मा विष्णु एम शंकर आदि देवताओं द्वारा जो सदा पूजित है वही संपूर्ण जड़ता और अज्ञान को दूर कर देने वाली माँ सरस्वती हमारी रक्षा करें Thank you, Ms. Divya, for that wonderful start of the event. Now, let us move ahead for the proceeding of this amazing event. Now, I hold this opportunity in my highest esteem to introduce you all our today's guest teacher, respected and honorable Dr. Manoj Sharma. He is an assistant professor in modern Indian history in Kirorimal College, University of Delhi. He has completed his PhD on neuralism in Indian cinema and uh, Indian cinema from University of Delhi. He has various lectures on Indian cinema at Washington DC, USA, Imperial College, London, Mahidol University, Thailand, and Kultur University, Istanbul, Turkey. He has been delivering live lectures on history and cinema on UGC's Bias channel. They are also available on YouTube. He has done films appreciation course from FTII, Film and Television Institute of India, Pune. He co-authorated a book titled CISF, Force of the Future. He is also an expert for Commission for Scientific and Technical Terminology, CSTT, Minister of HRD and also Consultant for Educational Communication, CEC, which is under UDC. He was also the principal investigator in innovation project titled as Role of Film in Education, in educating students, an innovation study of colleges of University of Delhi awarded by the Research Council, University of Delhi. He has completed a research project based on Indian society and culture for Microsoft USA. He has published various papers on Indian cinema and history in national and international journals. Now, I would like to take honor to invite him on stage and share his valuable insight with all of us. Sir, I request you to please grace us with your valuable words and guide us and give us permission to start our today's event. Oh, thank you so much. With regard to today's uh, presentation by one of the students, uh, I am also teaching this paper, The Making of Contemporary India, to the honors student. And there is a paper with a twist, this G paper, uh, Making of the Post-Colonial India Now, with some of the truncated syllabus. So I have been uh, teaching both these papers. So this topic as well is being taught by me uh, in the class. Since last one and a half years, though, we are not having uh, the kind of classes, the offline classes, which we were having earlier. But even then, this kind of an online platform has given us uh, some kind of innovative opportunities to, uh, earlier it was not uh, possible that way that the students uh, on weekly basis or maybe uh, whatever your uh, system is maybe monthly or maybe fortnightly. So they, they are getting this kind of an opportunity where they can come and they can present those ideas. Otherwise, what would have been in the earlier times that you have this kind of a seminar, 
kind of our paper presentation kind kind of a thing only on a single day uh, in the entire year but the way you are doing it uh, on a continuous basis as uh, manish uh, who invited me and we were as he said that we were batchmates uh, doing ma together so we have known each other for a very long period of time and have conversed on various aspect with regard to teaching learning processes so i think this is a very good kind of an initiative where the students they will get this opportunity to air their ideas and uh, uh, teachers from different colleges and maybe other universities as well and now because of this online thing uh, teachers from abroad also can have this kind of an interactive session with all of you uh, so i not Uh, talk much because uh, the time is uh, for the student uh, to convey uh, the idea so i welcome uh, uh, the person who is who is going to speak today with regard to the hindu uh, code bills uh, various kinds of bills which uh, largely four bills which came in 1950s and which talk about the personal laws and how personal laws uh, they are so personal that many a times they create so many problems in the society as well so we have to be very very cautious with regard to uh, these kind of ideas so i i i now request uh, the people those who are organizing to kindly continue with the program thank you very much for inviting me thank you so much sir for your humble words and informative insight believe me sir we are so grateful to have intellectual and scholarly teacher like you it is an honor for all of us thank you so much for your priceless words Now let us move to the major part of today's event which encompasses various projection and discourses on the topic ideas and debates on Hindu code bill by Ms Anushree she will be enlightening us with her informative talk she will be telling us about the, what is Hindu code bill comprehending on the making of bill debates and deliberation over the opposing views she will be also analyzing various ideas and debates she will be telling us evolution of gender equality as the theme of the bill and at last she will also tell us what is the significance of the bill in today's context now without any further ado i request to our today's speaker ms anushri to come on the stage with her topic ideas and debates on the hindu code bill and present her insightful talk ms anushri now the stage is yours thank you shubhi uh, no law passed by the indian legislature in the past or likely to be passed in the future can be compared to hindu code in point of its significance to leave inequality between class and class between sex and sex which is a soul of hindu society untouched and to go on passing legislation relating to economic problems is to make a farce of our constitution and to build a palace on a dung heap this is the significance i attach to the hindu code These are some powerful words said by the advocate of women's rights Dr B R Ambedkar. Good evening to everyone. We know India is a conglomeration of languages, cultures, religions, castes and identities in general. In order to define India, our leaders had first thought to bring about the necessary changes in our society. Changes were not just European in nature, but rather was the but rather were the first step towards bringing a change in an orthodox or an age-old society of ours. The Hindu Code Bill was introduced in the Constituent Assembly on April 11th, 1947, by Dr. B. R. Ambedkar, with the only intention to liberalize the personal laws in order to broaden the freedom of the individual and the equality of men and women in the Hindu social system. It primarily covered the right to property, order of succession to property, and maintenance, marriage, divorce, adoption, minority, and guardianship. the following are the changes that the bill promised to make in our laws the hindu women were granted equal share in their father's property the maintenance was also granted to a wife who lived separately from her husband if her uh, if her husband had a loathsome disease took a concubine was cruel to her etc there was also the abolishment of caste and subcaste in sanctifying a marriage and intercaste marriage now had the same legal and religious status Divorce was allowed on the grounds of cruelty, infidelity, incurable diseases, etc. Monogamy was made mandatory. Adoption of a child, irrespective of his or her caste, was now possible. These changes were meant to be inclusive for the Hindu women of that time. It worked towards gender equity. 
women in the earlier times didn't have equal property rights as compared to their brothers, husbands, and their sons. A woman's status, as we all know, was restricted to only household chores. The upliftment of their status in order to make them financially independent was the need of the hour. Ambedkar's main aim was to provi provide women with the equal rights in marriage, property, etc. as their male counterparts. It was the start of the social engineering of a revolutionary measure. The introduction of the Hindu court bill in the General Assembly garnered a lot of opposition from all spheres of life. Starting from the Congress itself, leaders like Dr. Rajendra Prasad, first president of India, opposed the bill as he didn't want any interference with the Hindu religion and he was against such a fundamental change in the Hindu beliefs. Other leaders like Sardar Vallabhai Patel and Shama Prasad Mukherjee, who belonged to the Hindu Mahasabha, opposed the bill. There was opposition from the public uh, sphere as well. Numerous organizations were formed to lobby for the defeat of the bills and massive amounts of literature were distributed in the Hindu population. Some vocal sections of the Hindu public opinion raised the boogie that Hinduism is in danger. Swami Karpatri Maharaj, a religious guru, vehemently opposed the legislation of the bill. He publicly challenged Ambedkar in the debate regarding the knowledge of Shastras. Swami reiterated his knowledge about the polygamy existing in the Hindu society under certain circumstances. There were others like Prabhudat Brahmachari, a silent protester of, the, of this bill, who was concerned with the moral values that were attached with the Hindu tradition. They didn't want any interference with their personal laws as they believed that the Vedic religion, being the most ancient one, had certain rules and regulations which were there since time immemorial. The abrogation of these rules in a single stroke in order to liberalize the society was not, uh, was not acceptable by Hindu conservatives. On the contrary, this bill was headed by Dr. B. R. Ambedkar, who formulated it and was supported by Pandit Jawaharlal Nehru. Nehru's idea of India was unique. He wanted to form a just state through just means. Nehru himself, a practitioner of Hinduism, was ready to carry out reforms in the traditional discriminatory practices. Ambedkar was known for his liberal ideologies, an activist of women's rights and, the, and of the untouchables. His idea of shaping a society was also unique. These two leaders stood by their words as they fought for the implementation of this bill. Ambedkar resigned in the later years as he was dissatisfied with the slow process of relating to the bill. But Nehru fought for this bill and was successful in implementing this bill in bits and pieces. After, after all the protests from all sections of the society, Nehru decided to pass the bill into parts. He divided the bill into acts. Majorly, these were four acts. Hindu Marriage Act, Hindu Succession Act, Hindu Minority and Guardianship Act, Hindu Adoption and Maintenance Act, these were met with significantly less opposition and between the years of 1952 to 1956, each was effectively introduced and passed by the parliament. These parts retained the rationale and driving force of the earlier unified proposal that was the Hindu Code Bill. The status of women was not equal to that of men if we have to describe it into legal terms. The equal share in their father's property was a major issue as it guaranteed the financial independence, which was the need of the hour. She didn't have the basic rights and was dependent on her husband. Women were meant to be like Hindu mythology goddesses, Sita and Savitri. On the other hand, their male counterparts were never expected to live in a certain way. To contextualize the social construction of women, in Indian society, one can aptly cite the text of Manu Smriti, where he says her father protects her in childhood, her husband protects her in youth, and her sons protect her in old age. A woman is never fit for independence. Women in India have rarely exercised property rights. The only form of property which she possessed was the stridhan, which she received at the time of her marriage, which could include movable assets such as jewelry, clothes, utensils, or cattle. In some cases, immovable assets, such as landed property, were also given as Tridhan, but she was never considered as the absolute owner of that property as well. The debate and criticism surrounding this bill becomes important as what ultimately had got introduced was a much watered down form of what was being proposed by the liberals and progressives. The attempt to codify the Hindu law was being guided by the British presidents who wanted a uniform body for the whole of India, 
but as madhu kishwar rightly points out there was no single or uniform body of canon law or hindu pope to legitimize a uniform code for all the communities of india no shankaracharya whose writ ran all over the country the legislature saw the indian customary laws as archaic which really needed earnest reform in order to modernize the society time and again the reformers put forward the argument that uniform uh, uniformity is necessary without explaining why simply assuming that uniformity is an unquestioned good the very essence of hindu law was its diversity and something which was not imposed from above by way of a sovereign authority the codifiers were trying to base the hindu code on the hindu laws which were derived from the dharma shastras and smritis but even in the hindu dharma shastras there is no attempt to insist on a universal code for all of the humanity the basic critique which madhu kishwar launches is that there was some much more liberal laws followed by marumi marumi kattam and alistana communities and the customary laws followed by the tribals in northeast of india but what got passed away as hindu ideal was the north indian custom primarily because the indian parliament was bo dominated both in terms of numbers and influence by members from the northern plains where social oppression of women was the most rampant another level of critique that comes from the feminist position is that multiple identities of motherhood constituted the core of the discourse the formative phase of a family law reforms also played an important role in the social construction of the identity of motherhood both the discussion around the bill and legalities initiated were woven around certain specific constructions of femininity babu bajinath bajoria the leader of the opposition saw women as nurturers of the family and as unsuitable to manage property and that giving uh, them property would destroy the very notion of the family some of the legislatures raised the objection that granting property rights to women would mean that she will get property both from the father's side and the husband's side and thus will get two shares whereas the son would uh, would get only one the orthodox view was against the very principle of granting property rights to women ganpat rai an advocate representing the hindu mahasabha stated I object to the granting of an absolute estate to women. My objections are that in order to keep the property in the family, they will begin to marry sapindas. That women are weak physically. That their character will suffer if they are given an absolute estate. Estate said the lawyer. The legislatures never considered the migratory nature of women in the sense that she leaves the maternal home and moves into. Uh, and moves to in laws house and as a married woman she has no separate right in her in laws property till her husband is alive and the nature of dowry complicates the whole story because it was argued by many that what the son gets by way of landed property the daughter gets way uh, by of dowry stridhan it was also argued by many that giving property rights to daughters will lead to more division of land all these arguments were strongly secured in the patriarchal structure of indian society where the orthodox male was simply against parting away their share in the landed property the discourse around the hindu code bill was primarily between the liberals or progressives and the orthodox traditionalists of that time this debate is still relevant and is going on till date between different schools of thought i would like to start the discussion by presenting dr b r ambedkar's view ambedkar who was ahead of his time wanted to raise the daughter up in the share of heirs making her share full and equal to that of the son he was putting the best possible spin on hindu texts and traditions but there were loud denunciations from the orthodoxy they didn't want any interference with the hindu traditions and customs for them religion governed their personal laws rather than the customs and traditions prevailing in the hindu religion as i have previously mentioned the doughty opponent of the bill dr rajendra prasad who thought this still uh, this bill to be unjust and undemocratic in nature he didn't protest against this bill during that time as he didn't want to prejudice his position his position on the consent on the consultation of dr of sardar vallabhbhai patel there was a hue and cry outside the parliament as well there was formation of an anti hindu code bill committee which had supporters like conservative lawyers and clerics another organization was the rashtriya swayam sevak sangh rss which was against the bill it organized a public meeting and the bill was condemned by various speakers 
one of the speakers equated the bill to the draconian roulette act of the british colonial state despite all the opposition that the hindu court bill garnered nehru and ambedkar were determined to make it into a law they made several attempts during 1950 and 1951 but the opposition was considerable both within and outside the parliament the orthodox members within the parliament were not ready for a change and also didn't want the status of a woman to be uplifted to an equal individual having equal rights compared with a man by this time now there was a discussion that was going on and it was about the passing of a uniform civil code or ucc indra vidya vachaspati said i do not believe that only hindu women are oppressed by passing the bill in its present form the state would give encouragement to the evil of communalism the rest of the members were happy with the bill as it was While I admire those who want to have one civil code for the whole of India, said Thakur Das Bhargava, I do not think that it would be a practical proposition to have one civil code for Muslims, Christians, Jews, etc. The Muslim population had already conveyed its message of no tampering with their personal laws as it was based on their religion, that was Islam. The need for uniform civil code was seen as a stalling tactic as believed by Ambedkar. Ambedkar thought that the passing of the Hindu Code Bill had already taken enough time, four or five years to be precise. The formulation, discussion and implementation for the All India Civil Code or the Uniform Civil Code will take another decade or so. He resisted this idea. He knew that the liberal faction was not strong enough to deal with the Uniform Civil Code with the orthodox faction of other religions. During the years 1948 to 1949, Dr Rajendra Prasad argued that the bill was highly discriminatory for it applied to only one community the hindus either the same laws governing marriage and property should be applied to all indians or else the existing customary laws of the different communities should be left untouched nehru was worried by the president's opposition towards the bill but he was also concerned by the slow moving process of the bill in a year there were only four clauses which were passed and subsequently the bill lapsed Ambedkar was the most hurt by the failure of this extraordinary bill as he was the one who led it and there was no significant progress over the years relating to its implementation in october 1951 he resigned from the union cabinet he felt that nehru did give uh, didn't give him enough support and there was opposition within the party as well prime minister nehru was leading the pro reform movement as he said that the real progress of the country means progress not only on the political plane not only on the economic plane but also on the social plane he worked hard in convincing his colleagues of the importance of these measures he wrote to one of his senior ministers a brahmin orthodox that we have to remember that in the acknowledged social code and practice of india as it had existed thus far there was no lack of moral delinquency as well as extreme unhappiness there were two codes one for the man and the other for the woman the woman got the worst of it always by now the anti hindu code bill committee had lost its momentum in the lok sabha the opposition to the reforms was led by the hindu mahasabha lawyer nc chatterjee he put forward his argument as if this indeed was a secular state what was uh, the need for a hindu marriage and divorce act why not make the same law apply for all the citizens does it the government honestly believe in the virtues of monogamy that this is a blessing and polygamy is a curse then why not rescue our muslim sisters from that curse and from that plight you have not the courage to be logical and consistent said chatterjee leaders like the socialist jb kriplani likewise felt that by pre- prescribing monogamy only for the hindus the government was being hypocritical you must bring it also for the muslim community said kriplani on the contrary his own wife the congress mp sucheta kriplani thought that the muslims were not ready yet for we know that the past he- history of our country we know what trouble we have had over our minority problem that is why i think the government today is not prepared to bring one uniform civil code several scheduled caste members also supported the reforms as they knew better than anyone else how hindu custom masked a multitude of sins the communists thought that the new laws were not radical enough in the lok sabha bc vidas termed them a mild moderate attempt at social reform with all the hesitancy and timidity characteristic of all social measures sponsored by this government 
the radical changes in the hindu law pertaining to marriage and property were majorly the work of two men jawaharlal nehru and dr b r ambedkar dolefully in the last crucial st uh, stages of the struggle ambedkar was a bystander nehru was determined to bring in effective changes in the laws of his fellow hindus but he was also prepared uh, but he was also prepared to wait before dealing likewise with the muslims as it is a well known fact that india was a freshly partitioned independent state the muslims were vulnerable and confused at this stage to tamper with what they considered hallowed tradition the word of allah himself would make them even less secure consequently when he was asked in parliament why he had not brought in a uniform civil code immediately nehru answered that while such a code had his extreme sympathy he did not think at the present moment the time is ripe in india for me to try to push it through i want to prepare the ground for it and this kind of thing is one method of preparing the ground there were other people who viewed nehru's caution in a cynical manner as dr shama prasad mukherjee pointed out in the parliament it is nobody's case that monogamic monogamy is good for hindus alone or for buddhists alone or for sikhs alone why not then have a separate bill prescribing monogamy for all the citizens the introduction of the hindu code bill was just not a revolutionary measure but was very much needed for the upliftment of women in particular it questioned the very basis of vedas shastras manu etc the status of a man in the hindu society was free and sovereign purna swatantra but the woman was bonded to him even now the husband was prone to treat his wife as a pair of slippers on his feet to be discarded at will and we see in contemporary times change is still relevant we as a nation have not achieved the status of being a liberal state as such there are still reforms that are coming up discussions that are going on relating to gender pay education etc we still have a long way to go the hindu code bill was one such measure which dared to bring a reform in a traditional society it was a commendable act by which various topics were brought into discussions and debates the changes brought by this bill were significant in moral and numerical terms it questioned the discrimination between men and women as individual citizens of a newly independent nation which was apparently being built on democracy it sought to formulate the new doctrinal basis of hinduism and it believed in the social democracy of a nation which is really important it is quite evident that india was like a boiling pot of water as we had been freshly independent from the british colonizers also partition was a big scar for a larger part of the indian population primarily for the muslims and for the hindus and the question of the uniform civil code ucc which comes into place can be answered by taking into consideration the vulnerability of the minorities to prevent the minority from getting into depression a wise decision was made by our leaders which was to not tamper with the religious laws of the minorities many people still question the decision made by our leaders and claim it to be bias against the hindu community but all these claims are a diversion from the reformatory nature of the bill i believe that all the four acts of the hindu code bill which came into effect are the most secular of all the laws they just have hindu in their names inserted but they hold the true spirit of being secular if we have to take up the question of ucc we can attain it into two ways firstly all religions can have a set rule of traditions and customs majorly laws governing marriage divorce guardianship etc which should be progressive in nature these laws should not be discriminatory not even on the basis of gender caste religion individuals etc for example there can be marriage laws relating to hindus muslims christians jews which should not differ with each other i mean there can be some cultural differences but these laws between these laws but the differences should not be discriminatory enough <clears throat> the second way can be the formulation of a unified or coded law relating to marriage guardianship adoption divorce etc every individual can follow these laws irrespective of his or her religion as far as the question of the implementation of the ucc is concerned we should look into this matter deeply in the starting i mentioned india being a state with multiple identities castes religions languages etc if there is a law like ucc which has to take place then one needs to understand that it is a tedious and slow process 
we have to take into consideration of all the tribes regional laws communities which are there in every religion and the customs and traditions which govern them it is a debatable topic but it is a start to a new change who knows after a few decades from now on there will be another ambedkar who will come up with a new plan which will be revolutionary enough to be implemented for the betterment of the society thank you thank you and indeed that was a very great depiction of thoughts views and even opinions on hindu code bill generally people you know they try to refrain themselves on putting such a kind of insight on the hindu code bill as well so as i can see like you have included everything from debates discussion even parliamentary debates were there right and that feminist perspective and its strength was amazing i mean it's amazing right so it was really uh, what i felt it was really a nice consolidation of you know various historians their views articles and and your opinions as well so that's what we wanted and that's what you have presented it was amazing Hi. i mean it literally i mean it. so without a further ado uh, let us move towards the question and answers that has been you know asked by our budding listeners so uh, let's move towards them so the first question has been asked by shruti she is asking my question is being in the legislature why ambedkar only focused hindus they were women in other religion too and they were too facing same atrocities like triple talaq during the period of time so basically she is she is asking about that why uniform civil code was chosen and not the you know why hindu code bill was chosen and not the uniform civil code so yeah okay uh, shruti is it right okay so ms shruti as i have already mentioned that india was a freshly independent state and uh, we have had our partition we were just uh, we just experienced partition which was a really uh, it was a scar on many people on uh, people consisting majorly muslims and hindus so uh, as uh, i have mentioned that nehru and ambedkar were a bit concerned about the uh, minorities as in if there will be any tampering relating to their laws they will the minorities might revolt or they will get into depression they will uh, try to uh, revolt against the current government and it is true that there were atrocities and oppressions that were being faced by other women of other religions but the hindu religion i mean uh, if we have to say ambedkar was a, a, a he was a hindu himself before uh, converting to uh, buddhist so he saw the condition of women he was a very uh, passionate advocate for the women's right and what he saw was uh, majorly so india was majorly a hindu populated state not generalizing anything but uh, he thought uh my understanding is that if we have to take in, uh, into consideration of just hindus uh, that is a very uh, obvious questions i mean it can be looked as a biased opinion but uh, at that point of time even a change in a particular community and it's it was not just hindus it, being a hindu is defined at that point of time a hindu constituted a sikh jain buddhists and uh, these were the four uh, religions that were covered in, among uh, in the hindu umbrella so i think it was not just for hindus it was a start which was used well said well said anushree well tried ajay next question thank you anushree and now we have another question by sahil he is asking that do you think that the time period in which it was uh, passed you know that the uh, india was going through the partition and the horror of religious turmoil so will you blame that particular you know time period so that the will could not passed would you like to blame that um, i i don't think so uh, the time period is to be blamed uh, blamed uh, yes we uh, did suffer from partition and there was religious turmoil but even if uh, like if we have to see it in uh, contemporary times any law re uh, relating to gender equality or religion uh, if it is introduced in the parliament even today there is opposition from all, all spheres of life even from the public sphere and from all the political parties from all the uh, religious leaders and from all the uh, schools of thought so we cannot blame the time period like uh, i think well so. said well said even i do believe the same the way you are talking i do believe the same now the next question is from akanksha nigi she uh, she is asking like do you think a bill that particular bill could change the mindset of the society like only will could do that uh changing the mindset of the society uh 
the mindset of a society is difficult to be changed. I mean, it's 70 years and we still have certain notions regarding uh, certain things. So we cannot change, but uh, we cannot radically remove a particular thing. But it, it was a start. Like these reforms, I mean, if there were some atrocities or uh, wrongdoings that were related to women or uh, the other people, they can now, they now have the right to go to the court and file a plea and just go there and be like as an individual citizen of this independent nation which is being uh, built on democracy i have the right to exercise my right and you know to just go there and fight for it so i don't think one can change the mindset but it is a start i mean these bills are provided for surely, us surely surely and the last question that i will take is from samriti she's asking that some people also claim that the hindu court bill was ahead of its time so do you believe it uh, I mean, yes, like uh, as I quoted in my uh, speech, uh, the text of Manu, that he said that women is just a property of her father, husband and son all her life and she has no independence. And there were some opposition leaders as well who thought that they're just nurturers of the family. They don't have anything to do. And the, uh, the women's character was also being questioned that, that if they are giving the absolute st uh, estate in the property. So uh, it was ahead of time. I mean, to think about, to even think about being financially independent in a in a society at that point of time, where only a few women from even the only from the upper class uh, strata of the society were independent, even if they were. So to generalize it, to to give to make people aware that you have these rights and you need to exercise them. So I think that it was uh, great. Yeah. Great, I really like that. So now it is over to you, Shubhi. Proceeded. Thank you, Mr. Ajay. Thank you so much, Ms. Anushri, for such an amazing talk. That was really remarkable and wonderful. And I'm very sure that all the virtual attendees released this session and took various insight from your very informative talk. And especially in the question answer round, you were commendable. You have tackled all the questions very nicely and gave all the answers very confidently. Now let us proceed to the next part of this next part of this GSTS session. And for that, I would like to call Ms. Kashish for she will be giving her talk on the next week on the topic parallel and popular cinema a very good evening to everyone i am kashir singh student of ba honors political science third year from shamlal college evening i'm here to brief you all about the 37 gscs talk which is scheduled on next sunday that is 24th october my topic for the talk is parallel cinema a genre of case it is well known to us that cinema is a mirror of society. It influences people and people influence it right back. But my question here is that whether this realism or this re naturality is evident when you watch movies like Kuch Kuch Hota Hai or Dil To Pagal Hai. Do you find any resemblance of these movies in your real life? Well, the answer would be a clear no. These movies appear more like a fantasy to be fulfilled. In fact, this real perspective of society is more evident in the parallel cinema. So on the next Sunday, we will be talking about what exactly is parallel cinema? What factors led to the emergence of this kind of cinema in India? We will also get to know the major filmmakers in this particular genre. Further, why 70s and 80s is considered as a golden period of parallel cinema? Then we'll understand the reason for its decline in 1990s and its resurgence from 2000, and how, over the period of time, the division between the two cinemas has finally blurred in the contemporary time. So stay tuned for the next Sunday to imbibe yourself with another informative talk on another engrossing topic. For them, goodbye. See you soon. Thank you so much, Ms. Kashis. Really, your topic seems very interesting, and we all are enthusiastically looking for your talk on the next week. And now I would like to call Ms. Deepa Tiwari, one of the editors from the exemplary and wonderful magazine Journal of Sarch, which is Journal of Continuity and Change, JCC. Ms. Deepa, come up on the stage before us and portray valuable insights and all the crucial aspects and all the themes that the magazine holds.
I would like to start with a quote of Nation Mandela: "Education is the most powerful weapon which you can use to change the world." Now, thank you so much for inviting me. Good evening, everyone. I am Deepa Tiwari, an editor of Journal of Continuity and Change (JCC) magazine. Journal of Continuity and Change by Graduates is a monthly magazine, an initiative by Saksh, the Society of History Department of Shyamlal College Evening. We will publish our magazine every month with a new theme dealing with the social, political, economic issue. of the particular month now we are launch our magazine in a special platform which is editors insights the next theme of the next theme of jcc magazine is incredible india the india is life is very good and blood of indians as you know the month of october is a month of celebration therefore journal of continuity and change fourth edition is set on the theme incredible india we are publishing articles poetry of our diverse and beautiful india i request to all of you articles poem related to the our theme of magazine and once again i request to all of you please read the magazine subscribe it and give your valuable feedback about the jcc magazine now thank you so much i hand over ms suvi thank you so much ms deepa we are enthusiastically looking for the next edition of this informative magazine and now moving forward to the next session of gsts and for that i would like to call dr manoj sharma to give his valuable feedback of today's event sir i request you to come up on the stage and give your valuable remarks uh, i think it was a delightful presentation by anushri because the time which you took around 30 35 minutes and the bills which are there four bills and the kind of background and the kind of continuity that from 1950s we are still debating whether they were relevant in those times we are talking about manusmriti we are talking about ancient times we are talking about nearly more than 2000 years so we have to think in those terms that bills they were not specifically rooted in 1950s a lot of background thing was there before that we are talking about scriptures and the kind of contribution which the people those who were associated with the bill they made and then you have to talk about the kind of uh, multiple problems uh, with regard to india whether as india is a multi religious uh, country where you have uh, prevalence of so many religions so some kind of a balance has to be created and in that sense hindu code bill and the coming of uh, these four bills and the kind of debate that why they were not being applied to other religious communities whether women from the other religious communities they did not have that kind of a right that they should be treated equally and that is how you see that the demand for the uniform civil code is there and at the same time you also have to see that bills when these bills came so they were there were certain questions with regard to whether they were ahead of their times or they were not ahead but the thing is when you have to think about reforms so the the constitution provided all these kind of reforms in a very sudden way women they were not treated equally but the kind of equality the right to freedom all these kinds of fundamental rights etc they were given to us in a, a, a through the constitution in a very radical manner through some kind of a legislative act so all these kind of things they will happen over a period of time social change definitely uh, will come Uh, in a very gradual manner and for the last 70 years uh, we are talking about these kind of changes so anushri was able to bring about or uh, bring out those aspects uh, in a in a, a, a very concise manner keeping in mind the kind of time she was given and uh, i think such kind of presentations will also allow us to think about these kinds of aspect because all of us are still debating about patriarchy and the patriarchal aspects all these kind of things though things are changing now because over over the years things they have changed and we all hope that things they will definitely change in future as well so thank you so much for such a delightful uh, presentation by anushri and i think uh, similarly as my work is on cinema and kashish made this kind um, of manoj manoj i i want that you come again for the next gst session i do agree because there are some miscommunication between us 
so I wanted to you be here on 37th GSTS. So if uh, you have time, so kindly be there yeah, as yeah. a guest teacher. Yeah, yeah, okay, so as a guest teacher, thank you very much uh, because your work on uh, neorealism and Cassis is going to talk about neoreal uh, parallel cinema. So I'm really uh, happy and I want to uh, like um, uh, request to you that kindly uh, do join us on next Sunday. Yeah, yeah. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Manoj. Yeah, thank you. It's a great. Thank you so much, sir, for your informative and valuable insights. Thank you for your kind and ignoring words. I'm sure all the listeners must have received various insights from your humble, scholarly and proficient words. Thank you once again. We were really grateful to have you in our today's event. There are always people who work in front of and behind the stage and grace the occasion with their priceless contributions to present the vote of thanks to all the members and entire fraternity. I would like to call Ms. Mandira Paul to take, o to take over the stage for presenting the vote of thanks. Uh, good evening, everyone, to the one and all present here, our chief guest, Dr. Manoj Sharma, sir, and all the respected teachers and all the respected listeners. It's such an honor for me to get the opportunity to thank you all. On the behalf of my team, I would like to express my gratitude to all for their present, the presence and contribution to make this event a great success. I extend my, I extend my gratitude to our guest, Dr. Manoj Sharma, sir, to take out time from his busy, busy schedule to grace the event. Thank you, sir, for inspiring and encouraging us with your words. I would like to thank our convener, Dr. D.N. Singh, sir, for his presence in this program. I would also like to thank all the respected teachers who joined us today and supported us. Dr. Pankaj Kishore, sir, Dr. Seema Meena, ma'am, Dr. Krishna, Dr. Simi, ma'am, Dr. Diljit, ma'am, Dr. Raji Kamal, sir, Dr. Shashi, sir. I would also like to thank the team for working hard to make this program successful. Now a big thanks to our speaker, Ms. Anushri Bist, for sharing her views and thanks to make our evening such an informative one. A heartly thank to all the students for joining us today. 